Greetings, ladies and mantle gents, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales, Tales from Outer Space. 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 And as always, I hope that you enjoy. Twenty Years Too Late, written by Stones, Dolls, Beetles. Across the black void drifted a paradise, much unlike our desolate home. Peering through our great telescopes, we found its surface covered by wide, grassy plains, dense forest of green-leafed trees, and deep, blue seas. Our own land was parched, our rivers cataracts, our barren soil only able to host a thin red weed. As our families began to starve, we hurried to build great ships capable of conveying us to that saving hope from ecological extinction. But a hairy pest, building cities and canals of its own, stood on two legs between us and salvation. So we filled our vessels, not with any weapons of war, but with the tools of an exterminator. Black smoke to flush out the vermin, and a heat ray to vaporize them. We packed our red vine to pollinate the countryside with our fruits and flowers. We crowded into our cylindrical spaceships, bidding our families goodbye. They bid us good luck and fair travels across the empty gulf of outer space. A few months later, we landed in a muddy, blackened land, pocked with more craters than the surface of Deimos. We did not dare to venture outside because of the great thunder that never seemed to cease rolling over our heads. As we assembled our three-legged threshers, we wondered if the earth was such a wet place that it stormed constantly. We would soon learn that storm was anything but natural. After several days, with our preparations complete, we unscrewed all three feet of shining steel on our lids. Immediately, we were set upon by the precipitation of a leaden storm. Shells detonated all around us, throwing up great spouts of earth. We understood immediately why this land was so cratered. We had landed in the midst of a war amongst beasts. It brought us immense satisfaction with our quarry already set upon each other. It would only be too easy to mop up the survivors. Our tripods rose from the craters of our own cylinders had dug. We surveyed the destruction, noted its abrupt end at a few miles east and west, and marched in both directions, towards whatever these apes called civilization. We never made it more than half a mile. The wall seemed similar to our own primitive history, with each side lobbing shells at each other until one surrendered. But the beasts had taken the crudeness of one shell and, uh, by multiplying it by a factor of five or six, turned it into a horror of unceasing, automatic warfare. Mired by the mud, we trudged towards the trenches and defenses that we could observe, but not under the fire of just one or ten, or one hundred, or one thousand, or even ten thousand. Instead, hundreds of thousands, perhaps even millions, fell as countless as raindrops over the next few hours. By any guess, hundreds of shells across the battle line were exploding every second, and the deafening roar made it impossible to communicate, let alone think. Our machines were not designed to withstand this great bombardment, and so by the time we reached these apes' trenches, only a quarter of our tripods remained standing. It didn't matter, we still thought. We still believed in the strength of our heat rays. However, while they stayed crouched in their trenches, they were concealed from our deadly beams, even as we grew closer and closer to their lines. Our towering machines overshadowing their huddled shapes, the defenders stubbornly held their positions. At last, we had closed enough distance to deploy the black smoke and force the rodents out of their holes and into our sights. The grim, gaseous curtain descended upon the trenches, but we saw not a single one hop out of the trench. We realized they had no idea what horror was about to inflict itself upon their lungs. Yet, even as the clouds did fill up their defenses, we could not find even one coughing straggler climbing out from cover. We assumed 
as the smoke blew away with a brisk wind, that every ape in those trenches had perished. That assumption was shattered when the impossible greeted our scopes. Somehow they had come to this battle prepared for our black smoke. Whistles shrieked up and down our quarry's trenches, and out the top poured thousands of screams muffled behind air-filtering masks. With grenades in hands, they charged our tripods, bringing each down by the legs. Our heat rays, mounted on the hood of our threshers, could not depress low enough to strike them dead. It was our turn to stumble backwards. Our formation had been crumbling, but now it hastily collapsed. In complete disarray, some of our tripods marched forwards, only to be picked off by artillery or the monkeys tossing dynamite below us. The rest of us withdrew to no man's land, to the escape promised by our ships. The apes began their counter-offensive. As we slogged through the mud, a new shower of shells landed upon us. Where they exploded, they did not gouge the earth, but released vast clouds of yellowish smoke. Every one of us had filters in our control cars to protect us from the earth's pollutants and toxins, but we never anticipated a weapon like our own black smoke being used against us. Only a few lethal particles per million made it through our filters, but that was enough to eat off our flesh and char our lungs. Many tripods hung limp after the ape's golden smoke drifted off. Their pilots drowned in their own blood. At least we reached our cylinders and dashed for safety, preparing to take off for a home and flee. Between the frantic punches at the control panel, I looked up to see great vultures circling above my comrades' tripods. But these birds were made of canvas and wood, carrying guns and bombs. With practiced accuracy, they strafed our machines with their guns, blew them to smithereens with bombs from above. Now heat rays could not keep pace with the frustrating flies that whirled in and out of our sight. We were soundly beaten. We did not think that what little civilization these men possessed could ever pose a threat to our harvest. But that was merely an error in our calculation. As I rocketed into orbit, safe from their planes, their gas, and their shells, I promised on my comrade's life that these men would not beat us again. I have a good reason to guarantee our victory. We have seen the absolute limits of human mechanical warfare, while they have only seen our tools of agriculture. They have yet to see our own blades and artillery and automatic fire. They have yet to see the true art of warfare, which turns the very atoms in the fabric of the universe into weapons of war. In these years since our humiliating defeat, we have taken the last of our dying planet's life and our last ounce of our own energy to prepare the final assault on their civilization. At last, then, we will have our garden paradise. In the year they call 1945, we will return to Earth. Surely this time they will have no idea what kind of ultimate weapon we can unleash. End of story. Story number two. We should have listened. Written by Kaiser 5243. Recovered ship slog. Designation research and recon sector 596364. Earth. Audio. Log one, day one. We have successfully entered high orbit of planet designation Earth. Prospecting team had a meeting with a life form that hunts local population and was warned not to pursue. Threat assessment shows this creature's threat is within allowed threat tolerances, and research for weakness and exploration for planned invasion will continue as planned. Interviewed hunter species designation Bamba appears to live in highly populated city centers. Samples will be taken from wooden and rural areas to avoid interaction. Log 2, Day 2. More human males located in woods area. Specimens appear to be naked and soiled with dirt and debris. We believe they spent the night in the wooded area for unknown reasons. 
specimens had been sedated and transported to hold cell 4 for further observation and testing. Log 3, Day 7 The group of humans display behavior similar to other pack animals that we have encountered. They seem to all follow the lead specimen A. Specimen A is the only human who has attempted to speak to us since their capture. The specimen, I as a group, do not appear to be concerned with the capture, and specimen A only repeats the phrase, You should have listened to the leeches, when questioned. Log 4, Day 30 The specimens have begun pacing their enclosure. We are at this time not sure if this is self-soothing behavior or if they intend to attempt escape. They have also been etching a count down from 30 on the wall of their enclosure since their capture. The reason is currently unknown. When questioned, specimen A bears his teeth and repeats, You should have listened. Medical experimentation to begin tomorrow. Log 5, Day 22 Medical experimentation has proved both frustrating and alarming results. The specimen's ability to heal damage caused to their bodies makes it difficult to keep them sedated, and any surgical procedures are almost impossible. We are uncertain if this is common amongst you. If so, physical warfare may be impractical. A larger specimen pool is required. Log 6, Day 29 A change has suddenly come over the specimens. They've begun laughing and pulling on the bars of their enclosure as if trying to bend them. Specimen A continues to shout, You should have listened! Over and over. We believe an escaped attempt is an imminent. However, threat assessment shows the metal of the balls of their enclosure has a much higher tensile strength than human muscles can bend. Log 7, Day 29. Vile corruption suspected. They've escaped! Hells can be heard in the background. They've changed! Screams. Of what suspected the best crew, we, c- we cannot contain them. The medical officer stops short. Reason unknown. Heavy animal panting can be heard over the recording before the log stops. Recovery team dispatched, unable to make contact with research vessel. Invasion force halted until we can determine the fate of the ship and crew. End of story. The algorithm reckons you should be watching this video next, and I recommend that you should be always watching my video. So, click and click with energy! And yes, clicking that does help the channel. Thank you very much. I would just quickly like to give thanks to our tier 5 members. Elithia, Barky, Pudicule, Meridian117, Cam Maxwell, Caspar Arnholtz, Albarden Gusta, Savage Patch Papa, and Lord Azrakal.